Hello, podcast listener, and welcome to our episode. Today, we feature author Patrick Reeder. We talk about the brand new book that he wrote, Seriously, S-I-R-I-U-S-L-Y. It's sci-fi, it's space travel. It also has Monty Python and Mel Brooks references right there in the book. Plus, Tucker and I detail what could be a serial killing taking place right outside of the building where we do our podcast. More on that in a future podcast. But for now, sit back. Relax and enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode of JJ Meets World is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. Natalie has a proven track record to get your home sold faster and for more money. She is consistently focused on her clients' needs and wants throughout the entire process and make sure that they are well taken care of. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to Natalie today. On average, Natalie sells a home every 3.74 days. That's at least two a week. And last year, Natalie earned her clients on average over $4,000 above list price on their homes. And you don't have to take our word for it. Here's some of the great reviews Natalie has received. I was overwhelmingly impressed with Natalie and all the Hatch team. She was very responsive and responded to all of the emails within an hour. She gave great advice and encouragement from the listing and pictures, the offer and all the closing details, the marketing team team knew exactly how to promote my property and I was pleased by how soon and easily my property received an offer. I was actually dreading selling my condo and Natalie did such an awesome job that I felt like I really didn't need to do anything. The thing I most appreciated was that she really listened to what I wanted to do and respected my decisions. I would definitely recommend Natalie and all the Hatch Realty team. They made this process so wonderful. That was from Diane. So listen, if you're in the mood to buy or sell a home, give Natalie a call right now. You can reach her at 701-388-9338, Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, at hatchrealityfm.com, or you can go to livefargomorehead.com, that's livefargomorehead.com, and find out some information. Huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring JJ Meets World. One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. Let me explain to everyone what we're watching right now. Outside of the window of our studio, a gentleman has pulled up a beat up old pickup truck. In the bed of this pickup truck are two chest freezers, same height. They both open into each other. So you could have both lids open and you could without having to and move things from one to the other without having to go around the lid. He opens up one and he takes out some paper bags with something in it. Then he moves them into the other one where he removes a bigger paper bag that has a larger object in it, and then he moves it around there. I do not see a a generator on there. I do not know if these are powered, but now, okay, what's he going to do? Is he going to take that big paper bag and put it in his truck? I'm assuming that this could, like, if this were the, oh, he's got a whole lot of it and he's going somewhere else. Are these meats that he's selling to a local business? We're really worried that half of a body is in one of the right. freezers and half of a body is in the other freezer. So I'm going to write down his license plate number when we leave today. In, in all honesty, if you've ever seen, like, a Kiss the kiss the Girls or Silence <laughs> of the Lambs, this looks like the opening sequence yeah. of it. Or any true crime show ever. Yeah. This could even be the beginning of a Law & Order SVU, right. if we're going to be honest. Right. So there are no locks on these chest freezers. So Tucker and I could walk down right now, open these chest freezers and dig out what is inside of there. I am afraid. Would you, I mean, if you, have you ever, have you ever mistakenly thought someone has committed a crime around you? I, I, I've been worried. I've been worried before. I've never had it confirmed that I was right or wrong before, but yeah, you go, do I call this in? I right. don't know if I do. But then you hear about stories where people are like, oh, if only someone had called that in. It's like, God damn it. I don't want to be that person. But I also don't want to be someone who goes, officer, we need to look what's in those freezers right now. I think they're full of human body parts. And he's like, 
dude, dude, these these are all this is the rhubarb I saved from last summer. And I'm just handing it out right now. Have you ever seen a timeout doll? Yes. Where it's wearing actual children's clothes, including a shoes, and then they usually have like a wig or like a little tiny baseball cap that goes back. But the hands, like the body itself, is actually like a pair of pantyhose mm-hmm. that have been stuffed. And so there's really no face to it, but you can stand it up in the corner and it looks like a little kid who's holding his eyes or her eyes crying. I had one of those that I picked up at a yard sale for a buck and it was in the back of my Suburban and I was about a two years into dating now my current wife and she looked through the window and she saw part of that sticking out from uh, the mass of just junk I had in the back of my car <laughs> and she goes oh my god what's that and I'm like oh that little kid and she started hitting me and slapping me at me and saying get away get away get away <laughs> And she thought that I had the corpse of a real child in my car. And I said, what? What? And she's like, well, I was going to call the police. She was going to call the police and bring the police here to investigate. And I said, we've been together for this many years. You, you don't think you know me well enough to know that I would not have the corpse of a child in the back of my car. And she goes, I don't know. Wouldn't you rather wouldn't you rather be able to prove your innocence? That's what they always say, though, on those shows. Right. Like he seemed like such a nice guy. He was our neighbor. The lawn was always nicely mowed. He was very soft spoken. (laughs) Uh, Well, good news. I showed her what it is and her reaction didn't change much because then it became, why the hell would you have this? What are you (laughs) doing with this weird doll? And I said, it's a timeout doll. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. This conversation has nothing to do with our episode today, but yeah. <laughs> but I can't wait on a future episode to inform everyone what's happening. I also want to do a quick shout out. I want to give a shout out to Jeff, uh, a, a good friend of mine in the banking industry who listens to our podcast religiously, even though the Dungeons and Dragons ones were a little m- much for him to swallow. Don't worry, Jeff. There's only one of those left. Yep. Um, Not for you, Jeff. The rest are. But he gives me gr- he gives me great feedback about it. And uh, Jeff is exactly the type of person who I'm excited to uh, be have as have as a listener because they're learning something new the same way I'm learning something new from all the guests who are here on JJ Meets World. Remember, our goal is for me to meet every single person in the world. So. We're working on it. Stop making babies so much. (laughs) Uh, Today's episode of JJ Meets World features author and retired teacher Patrick Reeder. Uh, Very cool. Patrick brought us a signed copy of his book. Right. And we get to talk about it. We get to talk. It's a he wrote a sci fi novel that deals with cryogenics and it deals with uh, exoplanets and it deals with space travel. And we really get into that and, and what makes it uh, so exciting to him. Plus we get to talk about how he was an, an educator and how he taught chemistry and physics and a little bit of earth science and what it's like to be a teacher in, uh, and he puts it eloquently where he goes, most people who have a background in physics don't end up teaching mm-hmm. physics. There's no no money in that. Nope, nope. But there's passion in it, and that's where it is. Uh, Patrick's book is called Seriously, spelled S-I-R-I-U-S dash L-Y, and it's available right now on Amazon. You can get yeah. it on your Kindle, or you can order a physical copy, which I'm holding right now. Thank you, Patrick, for bringing us a copy of your book. Well, like a rubber ball, let's kick this thing. JJ Meets World. Pat, welcome to, uh, I was going to say the day of my daytime show, but this is JJ Meets World. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you brought us a book, a signed copy of a book, and it's got your name on it. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Yeah, so t- let's get right into it. What's the book about? The book is about a guy that thinks he's going to go in for a test on uh, cryogenics, long-term sleep. And he wakes up, and he's actually on a starship, and he's headed towards uh, an exoplanet. And he doesn't realize this, and so it's all kind of a part of him discovering what's going on. And once they get there, all sorts of crazy things start to happen. What uh, What's it like to have an idea and then actually get it onto uh, the page? Well, that was kind of weird because... Uh, when I first started out, I was 
I was just retiring. That was, I was retiring from teaching and people kept saying, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I thought, well, I don't know. And then I said, well, maybe I'll write a book. And somebody said, yeah, you should try that. And so I did. And that was it. I just sat down one day and started writing. So really, you, someone just needed to tell you, like, you should do this. Oh, yeah, I should. Yeah, well. Because that's know, how this podcast started. Tucker was like, you should start a podcast. And I was right. like, yeah, we should. Was this an idea, though, that had been something you thought you might try one day? Or was it not even until retirement came around when you thought, this might be a possibility? Uh, as far as writing, I used to write in high school. And I would write short stories. And I always wrote about my classmates and things that would happen on the moon or different planets and stuff like that. But as far as writing a book, no, <laughs> not until I was in retirement and I was sitting there saying, yeah, I should give it a shot, see what happens. Now, we were talking a little bit before uh, we started and you had told me that the first draft of this book uh, titled Seriously uh, by Patrick Reeder, which you can find on Amazon right now. Uh, for digital download, you can also order a printed copy like we have yep. sitting in front and, of and us. Ser- S I R I U S, seriously. Right. So you, it, you had told me that doing the first draft of this book, I think you said it was like four months. Yeah. I that's, start, that's pretty damn good. I started writing in September and I finished probably late December. And then, of course, you start with your rereads and your editing and stuff. So, all in all, it ended up probably about end of May when I finished wow. it. Wow. Yeah. That's like Stephen King level fast. Yeah. You, <laughs> when you sit down at 7.30 in the morning, you have nothing else to do. And you, I, just, I would write through lunch all the way to about four in the afternoon. Really? About every day of the week for a while there, yeah. Okay, so uh, was this a story you'd been thinking about for a while? Just like you little bits and pieces clamming around the brain? No, no, not at all. In fact, it's crazy because most of my ideas came when I would wake up at night at about three, four in the morning and just lie there and think, huh, oh, yeah, that would work. And then <laughs> I, I'd quick go down, I'd write it on uh, pieces of scrap paper and I'd go down at seven in the morning with my little piece of scrap paper and I'd start typing and then I'd it'd just build from there. Have you always been somebody who's been interested in science fiction? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Saw every movie I could possibly see in science fiction. I read everything. When I was like five years old, six years old, seven years old, I joined a science club and you could, it was in a, in a um, magazine where you could send away for, and I, I want to say it was called the Apollo Science Club, but I don't remember, but you got a kit to build the lunar lander and a Saturn V rocket. And then every month they would send you a book. And so I took the money I had from my paper route and I subscribed. <laughs> So it, just science in general, has it always been a passion then? Oh, yeah. I was a chemistry teacher, earth science teacher, biology teacher, life science teacher, physics teacher for 35 years. So when you sit down and, and you decide you want to approach this, are you doing research on real aspects of cryogenics? Or are you just saying, I'm going to use the term cryogenics and I'm going to create my own science because this is a world... Uh, a mirror version of our world where the science gets to be what I want it to be. All right. Well, first of all, when you teach high school science, you're kind of that person that knows a little bit about a lot of science. (laughs) (laughs) So that's where it all starts. But boy, I did a lot of research like for, in terms of um, not so much the cryogenics because that's just a small part of it. And then I made up a whole bunch of stuff, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but in terms of the planets and stuff like Sirius, how far is it away? How long would it take us to get there? Um, traveling at the speed of light or nine tenths the speed of light. So I did a lot of research on that part. Was it, So that must be kind of interesting to be able to take, you know, theories and concepts that we have about space and put it into something that's, fictionalized to tell the story. Now, this gentleman who in your book who thinks he's getting into cryogenics, it, anything uh, at least he does he like science or is this 100% of fish out of water? No, no, he does. In fact, he is a pilot and he's a stratospheric pilot when so kind of getting into the story now, when World War 3 erupts, he is a stratospheric pilot. And that's kind of the start of the the book is that World War III has just ended, and we're rebuilding the Earth, but we've kind of screwed up our atmosphere. And so we're starting to look to go to other places. And then 
Um, the book is actually based on something that actually happened in Africa. There's a tribe called the Dogon, and the Dogon write, and this is like 1800s, they write about um, the star Sirius and a sister star that's with it. Well, we don't know of a sister star that's near it until about 20 years ago, we found out there Sirius has a sister star. So now all these things that the Dogon wrote about, they went back and looked at, and they found out that they wrote about an amphibian-like alien that visited them called the Namo. Well, if you go back and you Google it, which, of course, I had to, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are books written about the Namo, and they're just kind of brushed off. Well, that's kind of the premise of my book, that they have sent this guy, his name is Argentum Silverwood, and they have sent him and his crew to Sirius, not B, but Sirius C, which is a third star there, which is a star I made up. <laughs> and there's, that's where the exoplanet is, and that's what they're going to do is they're going to explore that exoplanet. Only he doesn't know he's on that because... He has a new technology that they've never tried called the artificial learning implants where they put uh, stuff behind his ears that he can recall information from anything they've implanted in there. So it gets kind of crazy. But yeah, it's all based on supposedly real stuff. What's it like to do like to have something on Amazon.com that has your name on it it was so cool you know when i when i first got the book in hardcover and you, you pull it out and you're like wow that's really something then the, the second thing you think is holy cow i've got something out there <laughs> and you know what if it's not what people want or what if they criticize it and stuff like that and you, you kind of get to that little fear in you as well you know haters gotta hate when it comes to something, and I know sci-fi uh, fans are some of the most discerning fans out there, but I think one squeaky wheel doesn't mean that the train's going off the tracks. But it's I, I agree, it's hard. There are times when I'll have I'll do something, and everyone thinks it's awesome and it's a great show, and I get one person who's like, I didn't really care for it, and then I focus all of my energies on that one person of like, well, what didn't you like about it? Well, what could I have done better? Be like, wait a minute, hold on. 99 out of 100 people really enjoyed what we just did. There's no point for that. So do you try not to read reviews, period? Or are you saying, like, I'm only going to read the good reviews? Yeah, well, I don't have a lot of reviews on the book yet. I hope that people out there will start reviewing it. Tucker but and I will. So far, they've been really good. And personal reviews where people come and talk to me, they've all liked the book. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so I haven't had any negative criticism yet, but that's just the thing is that I am waiting for that because there will be discerning people out there that will say, well, hey, that physics doesn't really work. <laughs> and I'll probably say to them, hey, this is all made up. <laughs> <laughs> it does on Sirius Star C. It does work that way. You can yeah. just make it that way. Yep, it has its own physics. Yeah, that's right. You know, and that and what happens in the book is that the three stars are actually pulling on each other and they do pass each other and that creates all sorts of craziness on the planet mm. itself. So that's all made up too. When you were just saying earlier that we, we discovered that Sirius does have a sister star, does does that mean that Sirius is a binary star system? Or does that mean that when you look at it from Earth, you, oh, we now see this other star, but it might not necessarily be right next to it. Oh, like an it. optical double? Right. Uh, no, from what I've read, and now I didn't research it heavily because, of course, I was more into the book, but it does have, it is in a binary system. Okay. Yeah, at least I, that's, that's what I read. That's just so fascinating to me that this, this tribe would have had some form of insight, whether they knew it or not. And, and I wonder if there was if there's any optical way to discern two stars or did we have to do something more advanced? Like would it have been impossible to know that that was a binary star system until what you said 20 years ago? Yeah. At that time, I guess it was impossible hmm. and yet they have it written and they also pass down the stories from generation to generation. And I wish I could remember the name of the man's book that he has an entire book just about the Dogon and the Namo. Hmm. Yeah, and he was kind of brushed off in the 1990s. But 
I didn't read the book, but I, I read his premise, so that was pretty good. So, I mean, I'm sure people have asked you this. You wrote one book. Are you going to write another one? Actually, I am in a chapter 12 of what's called Alternate. So that's the star Altair, which yeah. is, of course, in the constellation Aquila. And so it's the eagle within the eagle. And the reason it's called Alternate in the second book is because they're supposed to be going to Barnard's star, which we now know has an exoplanet. So the idea of this Argentum Silverwood now is that he is an explorer, kind of like Star Trek. <laughs> anyway, but he has oh, a... Hell he yeah. Has a, yeah. There you go. He has a um, crew of five, and they're all very bright doctors. They're all geniuses in their own right. And they're supposed to be going to Barnard's star to check out this exoplanet. Well, there is a mix-up in their system, and they end up at Altair instead of Barnard's star, so hence Alternet. What is an exoplanet? An exoplanet. We've heard that term enough times now where I need to know what it is. Otherwise, I'm going to sound like an idiot. It's just the planet that orbits a star outside our solar system. Okay. Yeah. And now if you're talking about exoplanets that are habitable, then they say it's within the Goldilocks zone. So the zone where life as we know it on Earth could exist. I do find it intriguing because that is the next great level of exploration. Right. There's still areas of our planet that we've explored, but not really areas where we can start over and we can go and populate in some way. What I'm interested in is the fact that at one point I really do believe that there will be a second planet that human beings from this planet decide to colonize, whatever you want to say with it. And uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of intrigued by that idea, and I think a lot of people have, and they've been in, interested in that for hundreds of years, because there are you know there's stories of space travel that go back a long way. Of course, some of them are more you know steampunky right. than other ones, <clears throat> right? Yeah. But I think yeah. it is something that people think about because I think human nature is to to explore. Yeah, and if you think about the size of the universe and stuff. And we used to do this in my physics class. We would talk about, okay, our solar system has nine planets. Our solar system is one star in a galaxy that has a hundred million stars. Well, that galaxy is just part of a small local group of galaxies, which is part of another cluster of galaxies, which is part of a super cluster of galaxies, which is in the known universe. So we would start doing the math And I think some kid figured it out that using the odds of winning the Powerball versus the odds of us being the only planet with life in the entire universe, it's like he said you could win the Powerball, I want to say he said 500,000 times. Wow. Yeah. It was was just a a crazy number that he came up with. Yeah. I... Space has always intrigued me. You know, going to the planetarium as a kid was something that was amazing, and the way we use stars to tell history to tell time to tell distance right uh i really find that to be very intriguing and obviously that's something that has kind of captured your imagination as well as you build onto this so you you're you're retired but now you you're a writer so now you're not retired anymore if you're working on a second book you officially are you know a full-time writer um do, uh, how, how did, did you self-publish? Did someone pick it up? Yeah, we talked about that. Um, I actually published through KDP, uh, which is Kindle Direct Publishing. Oh, nice. And, yeah, it was easier than finding an agent. I, had, I researched and went through all of the processes of how to get your book published because initially I wasn't going to publish. Initially I was going to write a book, give it to my friends and, you know, and get a hard copy and say, you look at, I did this. And then somebody said, well, you should publish that. And so I started looking into publishers and I think the easiest route and the route that makes publishing accessible to most authors is Kindle direct publishing. They actually do a very good job. It's so we are living in a time right now where people who want to do something have the greatest amount of tools available to them. This podcast is an example. If Tucker and I wanted a radio show, 
There's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. There's a lot of back and forth that you need to do. And then ultimately you're working for somebody else and, you know, selling advertising. There's always a middle person or five middle people yep. that end up calling the shots. As Tucker <clears throat> told me about a term, the term walled gardens. So like getting a radio show, there is a walled garden. Someone controls whether or not you get to play in that area because of things like Kindle direct publishing. It opens up the world for individuals who have been turned down by publishers who just, you know, who are in the middle of Fargo, North Dakota, right? It's not like you walk down the street and there's a publisher on every corner who wants to, you know, take your book. So I I think that that has allowed so many people to get to be a part of this world and has opened up so many more opportunities for readers, for listeners. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess YouTube would be the equivalent of television to me, podcasting, uh, radio, uh, Kindle, uh, and, you know, really any digital format of writing would be for literature. Are there any other walled gardens that people that we've figured out a way to get around? I mean, if I'm not recalling them right now, but they, they will announce themselves the moment their walls are broken, Yeah, you know? And the thing is, is that, you know, uh, Pat and I were talking about the book, the Martian, which started out as being free on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that gave, what was the author's name again? Andy Weir. Andy Weir gave Andy Weir the, the platform he needed to get seen in the first place. So I think no matter what, just having this in this, internet technology where you can have a direct relationship with your audience is a major component of it. The music industry, um, things were so expensive for so long because you had the publishing in the middle of all of it, raising the cost of everything and taking most of the money. And uh, after that got somewhat shattered by illegal downloading through Napster, artists started making direct relationships with their fans and started uh, submitting stuff directly to their fans. So I think there's a million different ways you could do it. Yeah. 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 So you're going to go the same way with the second book? I think so. I think so. You know, just referencing what you guys just talked about, when I was growing up, the only media for books was the book itself. So there was no downloading course. There were no computers. I'm a little older than you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to read a science fiction book, you had to have that science fiction book in your hand at the time. And so there was a lot of borrowing and a lot of going to the library and stuff. And that kind of changed throughout my life, you know. And now, like you said, Andy Weir, I just... I read a lot of those free science fiction books just to see if they're any good, you know, and stuff. And happened to pick his up, and I was astounded at his writing it was very very good my sister loves the free content on the kindle and then that like there's 25 cent content like really really ultra cheap content and she said one of the reasons i love them is they are not written like anything else you're going to read you know that's gone through a publishing process she said partially because they can't afford to have you know a team of editors and all of these people say, you can't do that. You got to take this part out. Legal says you have to remove this, da, 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 da. And so you get a different reading experience because of it. And she says she just lo- and she's fallen in love with so many books like that. And most of those people who are putting things out for free uh, are, are accessible in some way. Like mm-hmm. if you Google them, you can find their Twitter account. You can message them right. and they will message you back. Yeah. Right. So has Chrissy made any pen pal relationships with some of her favorite authors. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll ask her tomorrow. Like, I'm curious to know that same thing because I imagine she probably has, or at least people who are like minded when it comes to certain stuff. Now, truth be told, my sister likes kind of the trashier novels. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I saw like, like shirtless <laughs> romantic. Yeah. yeah. That. And then she also like my sister's most at home in the young adult section <laughs> of the bookstore. Oh, so, uh, she'll like reading stuff about you know, 17 year old, like dealing with high school problems. It's I don't an know why. It's incredibly popular purchaser. genre in general, yeah. young adult fiction. Yeah. YA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's big. Yeah. It's huge. Right. It's huge. Um, uh, I'd like to hear more about your educational career. So okay. you're, you're a retired teacher and I am the son of a retired teacher. So I, I, 
I just have a lot of shared experiences of watching my dad and how he fills his time now. Right now he fills it by buying a new Harley Davidson every year and, and trading in the old one <laughs> and uh, doing yard work that he ends up injuring himself. I would really love if he just sat down and started writing books. Although he did just recently he write, just a wrote book, a book. Uh, write a book too, but I want him to put the amount of time that you're putting into it. So uh, uh, maybe if you could give us the rundown of your educational career, where I could, are you talking? Yeah. Before we do that, though, I was going to comment on your mm -hmm. comment, uh, JJ, about in a smaller sense, you know, about expressing yourself on Kindle books is that I downloaded Grammarly because I wasn't a great uh, grammar person in English class in high school and college. And it does want to change how you're speaking. So even with Grammarly, which is just this mm -hmm. program that says, this is a bit wordy. And I all say, hell no, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I just leave it in there and then it'll go back and it'll say, you have 103 corrections to make. And I think, no, I don't. <laughs> no, and, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I'll correct the uh, apostrophes and things like that. But that's how I wanted to express myself. And so like you were talking about a publisher and all their editors, they kind of change what the author is trying to say sometimes, I mm -hmm. think. So this is good because when you read that book, you'll see that there are things in there that probably wouldn't be in a regular book because the wording is a little bit off. But I left it because that's my expression. It yeah. remains your book. Correct. It does, you know, I, how many people turn over a manuscript and it no longer is their book anymore? Yeah. They've had other ghostwriters who've come in and rearrange paragraphs and so i think that that yeah. is i think that's very cool and a lot of times there's reasoning behind it too like there are past stories that lead you into that thing that you're trying to say and you're referencing a story that you heard somewhere before and you want to tell it the way it was and if an editor wants to change it well that kind of takes away the realism of it for you so you'll find that in my book. And if you knew my history, and that's why I'm getting into history now right. here, um, a lot of my book comes from stories that have either happened to me or um, in the past, somebody told me this story. And so I just turn it into a future science fiction uh, quote or whatever. So it's kind of different, but. You may enjoy this joke. I, um. Uh Recently, it's the best way to start any joke. Yeah, I recently got a free the free thesaurus, and uh, boy, that thing is it's not very good. In fact, it's awful, and also it's awful. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah it's a good slow burn, isn't yeah. it? Oh. Yep. I'm glad you prepped us with. <laughs> yeah, you this may is enjoy joke. this joke. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, recently. Uh, learned this joke. So I've got people in my office who tell jokes all the time, and I never have something handy. I'm an improv comedian. Give me a scenario. Pizza shop. Okay, here I go. Uh, but I learned this one. I booked a limo last weekend, and it cost $300. And here's the thing. I found out it doesn't even include a driver. Spent all that money, and I've got nothing to show for it. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, now moving so, on. So <laughs> yeah. So so anyway. So your so your history as a teacher. When did you start teaching? Uh, I started teaching in 1983. So I'll kind of give you the background before that. When I was growing up, I always wanted to be a teacher. And the crazy thing is, I I didn't want to be a science teacher. I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't care what. I could have taught math. Oh. I could have taught history. But I was interested in science, and there were openings in science course because it's hard to find a science teacher so that's why i went into science in 1983 um, is that, is that in general it's actually harder to find science teachers than right now it's getting very difficult to find any science or math teachers because really? those people are going to go into jobs that pay three times more than what a science teacher gets paid right now wow okay yeah like i i have a physics background too and we i took a tour of NDSU's engineering department with uh, my students one time and walk in the door and this uh, doctor of engineering, she says, there's one of the most special people I've ever seen. And I kind of looked there and she goes, people that know physics don't go into teaching mm. because it doesn't pay. She said, we go into engineering and stuff beyond that because there's a lot more money. So she said, she said you are a very special person if you teach high school physics because the money just isn't there. What so is it, what is it about students. teaching that drew you to it? 
Oh, I, I love talking to the kids and getting the, the banter going with them. And uh, my, if you've ever in my classroom, there's a lot of jokes that go on yeah. <laughs> during the chemistry. I, I, my, my big uh, subject was chemistry and chemistry is not easy to learn. So I tried to make it easy to learn. And like for one of the things, like, I don't know if you know the periodic table. Well, first of all, if you can see my shirt. Yeah. I, I wear this shirt yeah. periodically. Yeah, it's a periodic table and it says I wear this shirt periodically. But like one of the things we talk about in chemistry is that, and some of the harder things is that some of the elements are diatomic. And I don't know if you know what that means. Nope. But diatomic means when it occurs in nature, it occurs with itself. So it's a molecule instead of an atom. So like, for example, hydrogen is always written as H2 because it bonds to itself when it's near itself. Oh. So that's a diatomic molecule. While there are only seven diatomic gases. So to make sure the kids knew this, we would call it the diatomic seven. And then, of course, they have to memorize which seven. Well, if you look at a periodic table, and you guys can see one right here, Starts if with you're nitrogen. listening, just Google periodic table, you yeah. can follow along. And it starts mm -hmm. with nitrogen, and if you make a seven, oh. there, those are the diatomic until you get down here to astatine. Well, in order for the kids to remember that hydrogen is also diatomic, we had this saying, you make a seven, but when you get to astatine, you kick ass to teen out mm -hmm. and put hydrogen mm -hmm. there. So they, you know, it's stuff like that where you got to give them these mnemonic devices so that they remember stuff. So that's kind of how my classes all go. I had two, went. <laughs> two teachers who, who really had amazing things like that, because I, I guarantee you right now you have a student somewhere from years ago who, it, you know, happens to look at a periodic table and knows that and says, like, you kick ass a teen out and you put <laughs> hydrogen in. Uh, I had a French teacher who took simple song melodies and then taught us how to conjugate uh, mm -hmm. verbs. So, like, uh, je suis bum bum ba da da to a bump. And it was the I Dream of Genie theme. Mm -hmm. And then she used the, the Mexican hat dance uh, for uh, je fais, tu fais, il fait. And so uh, it, 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 it's great when you do that. And then I had a, uh, a geography teacher who would tell, sto you know how you had to draw maps like mm -hmm. at one grade. Mm -hmm. So she would tell a story and you would just have to recite the story. And now you have to draw the map. And one of them was uh, using the uh, country of Qatar, but she called it guitar, guitar. So you were like, it was like a band going on a trip, but they forgot their Qatar. I get it. Uh, I mean, it's stuff that really, I mean, that was 24 years ago that I learned the Qatar story and it still is sitting there. I don't think I could draw the Middle East if I had to, but. You know, I, when I was in high school, I struggled with uh, science and math. It wasn't something that I took to very easily. The one science class that I took that I actually did really well in was physics for whatever reason, I would get a B in that class, whereas other classes I would get a C minus on a good day, usually a, a D or F. Um, and especially the toughest one for me was chemistry. And I wish at the time I had made the connection between chemistry and space exploration. Mm. Um, bef before we started recording, Pat and I were talking about exoplanets and the different methods that people, that scientists are using to detect them. And as detection resolution gets better and as we develop more techniques, we'll be able to start to analyze the chemical contents of atmospheres of exoplanets by measuring the starlight that passes through it and coming to us. I didn't have this concept of, is it spectroscopy? Yes. Where you were in light is the signature of the chemicals that it passes through. So chemicals will block out certain bands of light. And that's why when they look at a star, they look at its its light spectro spectroscopy. I'm saying the word wrong. Yeah. No, that's great. But, but they'll be able to look at that light and go, oh, that star is burning, is made of this or that. Yeah. And hopefully with that technology and exoplanets, we might be able to infer the presence of life by what is in the content of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that was that would have been a topic that I think would have got me to really dive into chemistry more. At the time, it was, for me, it was it felt like math. It just yeah. felt like numbers and it felt cold and unconnected to my, my existence, which couldn't be further from the truth, right? Yeah. And in fact, uh, 
we, in my classes, we always talked about how in the heck do they know the sun is mostly hydrogen and some helium and then the heavier elements and stuff. And we talk about, well, no one's ever gone there with a dip and dipped into the atmosphere of the sun. So we talk about how do they know this? And then we talk about spectroscopy and stuff. And so that that's kind of a lead into that as well. But going back to my past and growing up and stuff, my chemistry teacher, <laughs> oh, dear Lord, he was a retired principal. And I don't think he ever taught chemistry in his life. So he would sit on the desk and just talk about how there are white collar workers, there are blue collar workers. And because you guys are from a small town, you're never going to be at that top part. And Whoa, every day he damn. would come. And we never learned chemistry. The only way we learned chemistry is he would, <laughs> he would assign things from the book. We had a workbook. And another friend of mine that I went to college with actually for a year, he and I would sit down in our study halls and we would work the problems. And then we would show the other kids in the chemistry class. There were about eight of us. Well, I was a very small town. And I think uh, like my graduating class was 27. And that's because three of the juniors, including my sister, decided to graduate early. Otherwise, we had 24 <laughs> in, our, in our class. But anyway, um, we'd work the problems in study hall and the rest would sit around and we'd show them how we did it. And that's the way we learned chemistry. So chemistry was never going to be what I taught. I knew I was going to be a teacher. I didn't think I would teach chemistry. I mean, you were literally teaching it while you were learning it. Yes, that's kind of it. And that's the only way we could learn it is we had to teach ourselves. And so we would go back and forth and discuss it and stuff. And so, yeah, that was kind of self-learning there. And then, um, Actually, I was going to be a biology teacher because I love my biology teacher. And that's probably what spurred me into sciences is that this guy was so good at explaining life and uh, dissecting things and all. That was all so much fun. So I did go into what was called a composite science major at Mayville State. Little plug for Mayville. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, when I graduated, I went to Finley Sharon in 1983. And it was crazy because... I had interviewed at about three different places and I was offered jobs at the three different places, but Finley Sharon had just built a brand new school and the teacher that was teaching there was actually moving down here to Oak Grove. His name is Lance Kelly. Hi Lance. Anyway, uh, so I walked into a brand new lab, brand new equipment, brand new everything. It was just fantastic. And so I spent three years at Finley Sharon and then Decided my goal was 10 years and I was going to go into research. I wanted to do research in biology or research in something. So then after three years at Finley, I realized I wasn't going to get my master's degree at Finley Sharon. And great school, great people. So I started looking around where, where can I get my master's degree? Well, Fargo, NDSU, you know, and MSU. And so I applied for jobs all around and Dilworth. Um, hired me. It was a crazy. That's a crazy story too, because <laughs> uh, I was living with my my fiance's parents for a month before we were married in Canada. She's from mm. Brandon, Manitoba. And <clears throat> what happened is I had interviewed at Fargo Shanley. I had interviewed at uh, Dilworth, and then there were a couple other places in Minnesota. Well, Dilworth called me at about eleven thirty in the morning and said, mm. "Yeah, if you want the job, the job is yours." You know, just take it. And, um, so I said yes right away. Cause I knew that was in Fargo Moorhead and I was going to get my master's. I'd only be there a few more years. And then I was going to do some research. And then about half hour later, Fargo Shanley called and it was one of the priests, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, but he said, uh, yeah, we got the job. You got the job. You want it. Just come on down. And I said, well, Actually, I took the job at Dilworth just about a half hour ago. <laughs> and he goes, well, call them back and tell them <laughs> that uh, you want the job at Shanley. And I, I thought, the first thing that hit my mind is, hey, this guy's a priest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I, di I didn't. I, I stayed with Dilworth and I was there 32 years. And, you know, after that 10 years, I never thought anything about it. Got into teaching, got into talking with the kids, you know, doing the chemistry thing, the physics thing, and um, it just snowballed, stayed there for, so I have 35 years of teaching now. Um, 
Your shout out to Lance Kelly. Did he end up teaching at Fargo South for a little bit? Do you know? You know, he might have. I don't, I don't, I didn't follow him where he went. I know he was coaching at Oak Grove when I took over at um, Finley Sharon. I'll bet you, I'll bet you I had Mr. Kelly as a teacher. You probably did. You're like a football coach, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And not- then I had his, I believe I had his daughter as well. She got into teaching and she was oh. my pre algebra teacher. Uh, and I don't know if she ended up continued to teach or she moved out of the, the area. Um, you, and you know Pat Healy, I assume, right? You've met him a couple times? No, I can't say I have. Mr. Healy was the the teacher that got me to appreciate science. Mr. Healy approached science as this way of like, it's not just a textbook. Let's figure out a way for you to appreciate what you're doing. And so uh, he taught earth science. And so... In the month of December, he brought in all these rock tumblers, and then we learned about, you know, the difference, you know, in rocks, and then he would let us throw them in the rock tumbler, and we'd end up getting to go home with, you know, a piece of quartz or, you know, a shined up piece of amber or something like that. And I remember thinking like, oh, this because this is what I wanted. This is what I saw in movies where there's beakers and lab coats and stuff like that. And that was exciting for me when it came to science. Yeah, that that's really what makes it exciting is... Those little things that you do that the kids remember, like the rock tumbler for you, that's that's really big and stuff. And I would always try to do things like that where we would create um, brass pennies. And so I would bring a bunch of pennies. And, of course, you know, they had to be a certain year. Things pre-1983, they were all copper or mostly copper. After that, you know, they threw zinc in. But we would then mix the, the copper with zinc and heat it with nitric acid. And um, I'd let them take home a brass penny and they just love that. So yeah. there's little things like that. I, I think my father-in-law was a, a chemist for uh, one of the sugar companies around here. And so he's a man who appreciates nature, but he also appreciates like the, the chemical buildup of things. And so um, I don't know if this is something that is, he's always smelling stuff all the time. And he's always, you know, he's always trying to identify. He always wants to learn about whatever it is he's working with. And I think when you spark that love of science, it continues with you because it's a curiosity and mm-hmm. it goes on for such a long time. Do you have any favorite uh, authors in the sh- science fiction genre? Uh, actually, I've read a lot of the older authors. Um, I just read whatever comes along. Like we were talking earlier on Kindle, I would go to the free sci-fi books because those are the people that Mm -hmm. are, you know, they're the struggling guys that uh, you want to read their books and stuff. And so I would read their books mostly, but I've read um, uh, a lot like Asimov quite a few of his books and Heinlein read those books when those are go way back. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And those are all fantastic books. Uh, mostly though, when I was growing up, what influenced me were things like Star Trek. And then um, also there was another one called Lost in Space. And my, oh, my sister, danger, danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> yeah, danger approaching. But my sister and I would watch the show. She's a year younger than I. And then we would, act out oh really thing. and yeah we'd always grab my brother my brother was a year old two years older than me and he kind of had pointed ears so he always had to be spock <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah so we would do that and we would play the robinsons or i would be captain kirk and star trek and you know she would be mr scott and all this stuff so that was kind of a big thing as we were growing up and then i think the big thing that really pushed me to enjoy science fiction was when star wars came out Mm -hmm. star wars just kind of i had never seen anything like it you know i didn't go on to i hadn't gone to very many movies growing up and we're talking 1977 is when right star Mm -hmm. wars came out i believe uh may 25th oh yeah memory serves (laughs) i don't remember that date but i do remember that i had to wait about a year to see it i was actually at und when i saw it and it was just amazing So in my English composition class, uh, we had to write a review of a book or some media thing. And I wrote a review of Star Wars. And uh, I thought I did a really good job, you know, and it's 10, 12 pages and stuff. And get it back and write on the cover page, you know, back then you just staple the type piece of typing paper. I had to put Star Wars by Pat Reader and my composition teacher, she put 
this is not the script. <laughs> this is a review. You should have written a review of Star Wars. <laughs> I thought, oh man, I blew it. But it actually turned out pretty good. But that was the one movie that I thought, wow, that is really something. Yeah, it. I think that movie has captured imagination and it's had so many people go on. But I also hear people who say, I grew up with Star Trek, and so part of my dream was to do the stuff that they were doing on Star Trek. And all the little tiny you know, science fiction pieces at that time that are slowly but surely becoming reality, you know, touchscreen technology and walking around with this, the, the communicator badge, all of this stuff that people loved so much that they're like, we want this to be real. So we are going to make it. Yeah. Just that's, amazing. That's the thing with Gene Roddenberry, I think, was that he could relate this far out science fiction thing to things that were happening on Earth. And that's kind of what I tried to do with my book is that it's out there, but everything ties back to something that could have happened on Earth, you know, with inventions that might happen in the future. And, you know, they're, they're part of the book in there. They talk about clear steel. Well, there's no such thing as clear steel. And what it is, is it's it's a diamond carbon matrix mixed with steel. And when you introduce a current, the thing can change color or it can mm. become transparent. So like their view screen in their ship is made of clear steel and it's just a wall on the ship. But when they introduce a current, it opens up a transparency and they can see out into the stars. So that's one of the things in there is it's clear steel. And um, it's kind of on the same vein as with what Gene Roddenberry was doing. And I, I really like science fiction where they relate things mm-hmm. to what's happening on Earth. <clears throat> you know, when you read science fiction and they're in some distant universe and they have their own world and they're not human-like and stuff, I I have a tough time reading that, but boy, if you can relate it to things on the earth, I love those books. I was a, a fan of Jules Verne oh, yes. when I was a young man. I would read that stuff nonstop, talking about going to the library mm-hmm. and picking something up. And the the first thing I read was The Time Machine, and I was just enamored by this idea. Um, and then at one point, I got into Planet of the Apes. Oh, yes. And yep. so I saw all the Planet of the Apes movies, a lot more than probably a kid who was born in the 1980s probably should have seen Planet <laughs> of the Apes. Um, but it, I, I, I agree. I like when I have some kind, when there's sort of a something tangible to me in the story. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, Luke Skywalker came from a rural farm. You know, they're farming water, but it was a rural farm community. And I felt like, Oh, I'm Luke. I'm just like Luke Skywalker, mm-hmm. right? I'm from this rural area of the country. <clears throat> I dream of bigger things, and maybe one day I'll be a part of the space opera. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of in the book. That's I. I try to be relevant to things on Earth. Of course, now Earth is in the 2070s and 2080s, but a lot of this stuff. When this guy is in his cryogenic sleep, in order to keep his brain active, this artificial intelligence her name is Haley she introduces old movies to keep his brain stimulated interesting so during the book he'll just quote an old movie and there's a lot of Monty Python in there oh yeah, oh, yeah the holy grail there are those that call me Tim is in there and stuff and I, I, I pick on stuff like that so all of a sudden this Asel that's his nickname he will just quote an old movie from Monty Python or Mel Brooks. There's a lot of Mel Brooks stuff oh, in nice. there too. Yeah. And so, uh, that's kind of, I kind of tried to keep it relevant to things that are happening now. And to him, they're ancient movies, but they're in his brain. Cause he supposedly watched them over the nine years he was in this cryogenic stasis. So I- interesting. So you chose a, f- like you chose a future 50 to 60 years from, from now yes rather than saying like 300 400 years so when you because th- putting myself in this mentality when i think of 2019 versus 1949 so a 70 year jump the street that i'm looking out <clears throat> excuse me outside of the window here existed 70 years ago it's been redone since then and there have been changes but the layout of the street has still been there so when you jump ahead 
50 to seven, uh, 50 to 60 years, there are things that still make sense. It's not like all of a sudden you're dealing with new Austin, a version of Austin, Texas that they built, you know, uh, mm-hmm. 50, you know, 50 miles away or something like that. So that's got to make, that's got to make it pretty interesting because really anything you look around could be an inspiration for this. What is this going to look like 60 years from now? Mm-hmm. Very yeah. cool. An example of that is like all the countries do exist, but um, how the third world war starts in there is, is Norway is actually <laughs> a bad, well, it's not a bad country, but they're in collusion with the Russians and they develop um, a I always weapon. knew it was going to be the Norwegians. Uh, you know, yeah, they, they got that shifty look to them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they, they developed something they called the Hammer of Thor, which are simply long steel rods, tungsten rods that orbit the Earth. But if you send them flying towards the Earth, the physics, you know, with the gravity picking up their acceleration and stuff, they can act like a nuclear weapon if you know you make it with enough mass. So that's kind of the, one of the weapons, but it's something that's real that you could actually do that. Mm. And so that's one of them. And it's actually the World War starts with three different countries. Nobody really knows who started, but it started in space orbiting the Earth. China, I think, was involved in Norway. And then, of course, the U.S. was involved with the Star Wars back from the Reagan age. <laughs> Nobody knew we had it. That's in the book. Nobody knew we had it, but we had it. <laughs> and so we try to deter the Chinese and the Norwegians from starting a world war. And actually, the world war does start and it gets into drone warfare and stuff. But that's just the beginning of the book. And then from there, it takes off that now we got to get off this earth because we have really destroyed that atmosphere and how long is it going to last so they're now they're looking for exoplanets and stuff and then that's when my imagination really goes crazy and i start inventing cryogenic sleep so they can sleep for nine years Mm -hmm. and clear steel a ship that could withstand forces where you're traveling near the speed Mm -hmm. of light and stuff like that oh that's very awesome what a neat imagination to be able to wake you up in the middle of the night and make you go grab a piece of paper (laughs) Yeah, that's that's it's so weird because that's usually when I was doing my clearest thinking would be about four or five in the morning. And then that's when I would think, hey, that's just not going to work. And so that's when I go down and I rewrite the whole dang thing and stuff. So kind of like that's what's happened with the second book. I have the ending for the second book. I just have to figure out how to get there now. Oh, cool. I have the story. I just have to put it all together. And it's quite different from this one this one's is strictly exploration and i know if you when you read the book they do find an ancient civilization on this planet and they go through the an ancient city and they discover different things in the ancient city and then uh, their big plight is to get back to earth they don't know how they're going to get back to earth and uh the guy well, I can't tell you the end. Right, but, yeah, save it for uh, the purchase. Let's just say yeah. not, not everybody lives. I'll just, we'll yeah. put it there. Some, there's some a little emotional grief moments. in there, too, and there's some emotion in there as well, yeah. Well, Pat, uh, the book is seriously, S-I-R-I-U-S-L-Y, seriously. It's available on Amazon? Yep, Amazon uh, and Kindle e e kindle books or you can buy a paperback or you can contact me and i can get you an autographed copy oh there you go yeah. isn't that nice when people can get a hold of folks and then you can send them a signed copy of it yeah yeah Man. that's good well and, and so uh, if they're going to get a hold of you how do they find you online um they can i'm on facebook so if you want to just go on facebook you can find me there or um i do have an author's email that I have established in June, which I have zero <laughs> people. <laughs> but it is, it is in, if you open the, the Kindle um, purchase area and look under my story, that, that is there. The email is there, but nobody has taken advantage. I think it's patrickreader.books at msn.com, I think is the actual one. And I have zero emails so far, so so we'll, let's uh, load them up, folks. Let's yeah, get them all those emails. You bet, and I'll get you an autograph copy, no problem. I'm excited for you. Yeah, you know, at one point, I imagine you'll get feedback where people want to know more about the story. You know, say, like, well, what happens after? You know, what happens after the last page? Yeah, that's alternate. Actually, picks up 
only a few years after they get back. Very well, cool. Well, some of them get back, but <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Pat, thank you very much for making some time today. Oh, thank no, you for being my, an, an eight class educator. I'm sure you've got a lot of students out there who have been deeply yeah. impacted over the years and now they can pick up your book. Sure, yeah. And if you want to ever just talk about stories from the classroom, I can <laughs> you got, I can talk you got hours a lot of them. on that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, we've been talking about trying to do an episode where we get four or five educators in a room together and they all can kind of just tell stories and they can banter back and forth because I imagine the break room in a school is where there's a lot of funny jokes. Like you'll never guess what's going to happen during second oh, yes. hour today. Oh yeah. We have gone through a lot of good laughs through the years and stuff and talked about things that people have done. And <laughs> <laughs> in fact, some of that's in the book. And I just got to share this one with you because yeah. this is in the book and it's funny is um, we had, I can't mention the guy's name, but he used his body as a human rudder to guide. A couple of ladies were on Lake Sakakawea fishing and what happened is the wind came up and then Lake Sakakawea is a big lake. So what they did, what he did is he and his dad were fishing and he saw these ladies were struggling. Their boat just simply couldn't keep up with the waves and they were drifting out into the giant lake. So he dived into the lake, swam to the ladies boat and used his body as a human rudder <laughs> to guide the boat to, <laughs> to shore. <laughs> And so we you know, we've had a lot of laughs about that over the years in our in the teachers' lounge. So I had to put that in. So in somewhere in the book, Argentum Silver <laughs> <laughs> uses his body as a human rudder to guide a raft to shore. <laughs> oh, that is some wild stuff yeah, right there. So there's a lot of that in there where where you know when my friends read it, they'll start laughing and they'll say, "Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's there." Yeah, so. Oh, anyway, that's cool. just like one of the stories that are shared in there. I, I imagine the book is just stock full of stories, yeah. experiences, and little moments that call back. So uh, it, it, if you're someone who was in your class or knows you, it's probably full of Easter eggs. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Very cool. Well, Pat, thank you very much. Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, it was nice meeting you. A huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring this podcast. Folks, if you're looking to buy or sell a home, contact Natalie Deutsch today because Natalie Deutsch is not only a previous podcast guest, she's somebody who's going to care enough to sell your property for top dollar. She's also going to find you the best price possible if you're purchasing a new home. Last year on average, Natalie earned her clients $4,000 over list price on their homes and sold them faster than the market average. On average, Natalie's selling a home every 3.74 days. That's two homes a week. Those numbers don't lie. Find out why Natalie is one of the top agents in this entire market. Get a hold of her today, Natalie at HatchRealityFM.com. You can also call 701-388-9338 or go on to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's LiveFargoMoorhead.com. Read all of her amazing reviews and then listen to her episode of JJ Meets World. Thanks again to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com, and you can find direct contact info for JJ. I'm thinking about writing a book. It's going to be called Seriously, S-E-R-I-O-U-S-L-E-E. -E. It's about a guy named Lee who's super serious. <laughs> <laughs>